him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. Well, welcome to Pilgrim on the 405. We have a great conversation ahead of us today with Mike Gorell. Mike is, is part of one of the fastest growing CPA firms in the country, Armanino, and he has a special practice that focuses on cannabis and hemp. So welcome, Mike. Thank you, uh, Will. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how, how you got to the place where you're focusing on cannabis and hemp in a CPA firm. Well, you know, I was noticing back in like 2015 as, as Colorado and Washington State and Oregon were all making uh, adult use cannabis legal, you know, California was going to be the next big state. And so I left Texas and moved to California and just started working in the area, learning about, you know, all the different nuances in the, in the tax law. And, and realized that no one else was really taking on this industry because it was just too strange and had too many nuances. Each state was very different, but my background you know, was in state and local tax with big four accounting firms. And so I was comfortable working in multi-state environments. Well, okay. So now that you are so how roughly how many clients do you have separate company cannabis and about a, about a hundred is is about how many we have so we're in the space you know all in all you know not only in california but throughout the country we have many clients that are mso's as we call them uh they're multi-state operators and so they they have operations in multiple states and some of them are publicly traded on the canadian stock exchange so talk to me a little bit then about tell me about tell me about the industry. What have you learned about the industry? Well, the industry is changing constantly and and you know what was prevalent in a, a few years ago is now changing uh, and people's buying habits are changing. COVID changed uh many ways that cannabis companies operated because you know on the good side you know, they were deemed essential businesses, so they were able to keep their shops open. But because of mass mandates and, and still fears about spreading COVID, many of the dispensaries had to shift to a delivery model, uh, which was not part of their business plan. And so they, they started having curbside delivery. They started, you know, having delivery to, to people's homes. And, and so the, the business is always changing. And I just got back from... Um, the Hamptons, where there was a, a, a cannabis uh, expo there. And you just see everything that happened in California happening now in, in New York as they plan to get their regulations in place and people start getting their licenses and opening shops uh, next year. Well, all right, so, so are these small businesses that are starting or are they large businesses that are, that are now dropping their, uh, their feet into New York? What, 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 who is in the business? Yeah, and what, what generally happens is, is that as these new markets open up, you know, as I was mentioning, uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, the tri-state area, but then you had Massachusetts that was legal a, a, a year or so ago, Illinois, uh, Michigan, and as these new markets open up, many of the California cannabis companies are realizing that the market here is getting pretty saturated. There's a lot of uh, competition, many opportunities to acquire cannabis. And so what they're looking to do is move their brand eastward. And just like you have brands for alcohol and tobacco and other, um, you know, regulated type industries, cannabis is no different where your brand uh, can carry you very far and, and make your company get a valuation much higher than it would be uh, if it wasn't a recognized brand. Well, now we, we talked before uh, about, about the goal that many of these companies had. We, we talked about helping companies get established uh, uh, when they get to a certain size to begin helping them put together operating systems that are going to endure for a while. And you said that for the most part, that was kind of irrelevant, right? 
Yeah, and it's un, it's unfortunate because unlike other you know startup industries where people want to you know build a company, maybe a family business or something, because you know the cannabis business is very you know um, you know it's, it's very collegial with one another, and in many cases you'll see where the father has one part of the business, the the mother has another you know part of the business that, that she's working on. Maybe brothers and sisters are in the business as well. And you would think, hey, this is great. You're going to start like, like a family farm or something. Uh, but unlike strawberries and maybe some other types of uh, agricultural crops, <coughs> excuse me, um, cannabis, what many people want to do is, is, is to grow the business for, you know, three or four years, maybe five. And then they want to sell to a, a, a much larger entity and, and basically cash out uh, with their millions. Uh, they're not le looking to set up a family legacy. And because of that, they're, they're a little short-sighted, I think, because they're not looking at how to run their business efficiently, how to, to make their business you know, better. Uh, they're just looking, how can I grow the top line number and then sell to the highest bidder mm -hmm. down the road? Yeah, and that's that's an interesting piece. Uh, uh, now, uh, how how does how do people compete in this industry? Well, I mean, they 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 compete aggressively, but you know, it's still a um, a hometown kind of market. So that you know, I had an instance last year where one of my clients during COVID um, had one of their machines break down. And they went down the street, literally down the street to a competitor and, and said, hey, do you happen to have a part that would work for my machine? And the, the, the other competitor not only uh, had the part, but he sent his engineer to help install it. You know, mm -hmm. and that kind of, you know, collaboration, you know, is great. And this is one of the things I love about this industry. But, you know, as these entities get larger, they get bought out by bigger and bigger entities. Um, it, it, it will kind of die off, I think, in the future. Well, what have you noticed about change from 10 years ago, 15 years ago to today? Well, you know, the, the public perception of, of cannabis has certainly changed dramatically, you know, because before it was, you know, the Nancy Reagan era of war on drugs and you must keep your children away from drugs because it's a gateway to, you know, cocaine and other more serious drugs. And I think now people realize that, you know, there are many medical benefits to cannabis that, you know, are just now beginning to be explored. There must be at least a hundred different compounds in the cannabis plant and none of them have been really tested fully and isolated for all the different uses that they can be, um, you know, implemented. Uh, for medical use. And so I think the, you know, big pharma companies are now starting to, you know, conduct more serious research uh, in this area. And, you know, for the longest time, the University of Mississippi was the only source to get legal cannabis for research purposes, <laughs> which is kind of ironic that it would be, you know, Mississippi, which is a very conservative state. But it's also a very humid and, and warm, you know, state so that, you know, just like growing cotton, it's, it's a great environment to, to grow cannabis as well. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the future? The future I see it, it involving somewhat like the, uh, the, the micro breweries uh, where you had these small producers, you know, producing small batches. Of, of product, and I see cannabis doing the same thing. There will always be the Anheuser Bushes and the large, you know, entities that are, you know, have a nationwide brand. But everybody's going to want that unique uh, product that is, you know, still tied to maybe a family that 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 really has, you know, small quantities available that they want to be able to tell their friends, hey, you can't just go into any dispensary and get this. I got a connection with somebody that can get us this stuff and and that's going to be again where branding and 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 marketing is going to play a big role is is this a, still a market for entrepreneurs to get into oh yes definitely uh and and i think that you know one of the things that we're seeing across the country as as new licenses opportunities open up is that social equity is playing a big role here where you know local governments and state governments are, are, are doing everything that they can to allow 
people of, of color and those that have been um, prosecuted for, you know, small infringements of, of having, you know, possessed a small amount of, of, of marijuana, that now they can go in and, and, and start up a business and, and get funding by others as well. And, and so this is a great opportunity to, to help these people um, that have been harmed by the war on drugs. Uh-huh. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, that's great. And, and now uh, I'm presuming that as these companies grow, they will be they will be providing taxes for municipalities, right? Oh, yes, indeed. And and in fact, that's what you know. All of these municipalities are counting on because when you think about the manufacturing industry, for instance, a lot of that has moved offshore to China and overseas. And, and so in these rural communities, there's not many opportunities for new job growth. Yet cannabis is the perfect uh, industry for this because, you know, once a cannabis company gets involved in a, in a community, now you've got lighting companies and fertilizer companies and electrical contractors and all these other uh, industries are having to like work and cater to that, you know, cannabis company that is getting established. And that helps with the job market in those rural areas, because oftentimes you don't really, other than maybe a dispensary, you don't want to be in a downtown suburban area. You want to be, you know, somewhere remote uh, where you have lower costs. Well, that's interesting. That's certainly along with what we've learned in COVID, isn't it? That uh, you no longer have to be where the headquarters are. You can be remote and uh, zoom in. Yeah, yeah. And it's, again, creating just great opportunities for rural communities, you know, to, um, you know, get this business in there. And it helps, you know, the diners and all the restaurants and, you know, just other ancillary businesses as well in the community. And then, you know, the taxes, as you were mentioning, is a huge part of it because, you know, I make the analogy of, of casino gambling. You know, it used to be you had gambling in Las Vegas and Atlantic City, and that was pretty much it here in the U.S. But then, you know, over time, you know, gambling has evolved where now it's in every state on all these different Indian reservations and everything, and the stigma has, has now gone, and that has now become sports betting online now, yeah. where you don't even have to have the physical presence anymore. And, and so I see cannabis going the, kind of the, the same way where, you know, there's just, you know, so much opportunity for these smaller communities to generate some significant tax revenue and, and it's one of those voluntary taxes. So instead of increasing property taxes and other, you know, income taxes to make ends meet, all they have to do is allow cannabis um, to be legal in their community. And then the tax proceeds from that will help pay for schools and all kinds of, you know, beneficial programs. Interesting, interesting. Well, how have, uh, what, what kind of resistance have you seen or have you heard from, from your clients, resistance to cannabis or hemp in, in, a, in a locale? Well, you know, what I see is, is that there are certainly conservative districts. And, you know, one thing that people that, you know, don't realize in California, when Prop 64 was, was passed in 2016, you know, the local governments had the opportunity to opt in or opt out of allowing cannabis uh, in their community. And they could have, they could decide, hey, we want cultivation, but we don't want, you know, dispensaries, you know, retail stores in our, our, our location. And, and what they're finding out is that 80% of them said, no, that we, that we want no cannabis at all in our community. And now they're realizing that, well, it's not as bad as we first anticipated. The tax revenue is a good thing. And it's sort of like, you know, uh, dry liquor uh, laws where if I don't allow it in my county, the people in my county are just going to drive across the, 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 right. the border to another county and right. get their product and bring it back into my county anyway. So I might as well take advantage of it and, and collect the tax revenue. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting thing, very interesting thing. I mean, I think a couple of things are happening. Uh, one is as we remove that old uh, reefer madness mentality and recognize that it is it is a plant and it's got some very helpful, health, healthful 
uh, uh, uses, uh, and that it is not th that it's not the drug itself that is the gateway drug. That that's more of a community environment. So, uh, and and then moving away from from this uh, war on drugs, and then on top of that to begin to understand that there's a monetary benefit to participating in this. Uh, that's a lot of pressure on city council. There is, and you know, one area that, that is really, um, you know, just needing more attention is, is the female market. You know, most of these brands, you know, will have like some sort of aggressive packaging and, and labels and colors and things that are really geared to the, you know, 21 to 35 year old male, you know, and, and, and there are so many women that, you know, gain benefits from, from, from cannabis, you know, from being able to sleep and, and, and other things, you know, sometimes, you know, they don't want to get like crazy high. They just want to relax, like, you know, having a glass of wine, have maybe some cannabis that will, you know, relax them. And there's, you know, starting to become more and more companies that are gearing to the female market where their packaging is is geared towards them the dosage is is lower um and it's geared to you know different moods that they may have and you know want a different kind of effect than what a male wants where they may just want to you know have a big <laughs> you know uh hi well and and uh i interviewed uh, uh philip rebentish from God a story and he is dedicating his life to he's got a, a site called don't strain yourself and and it's 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 got to do with educating people on the medicinal values of of cannabis and uh and then getting stories and having conversations with people about that i think that's a really important piece uh to educate people uh, not necessarily increase sales but to increase the well-being that people have yeah exactly and you know i think that you know cannabis products can be used in in, in many different ways and and like anything it can be abused but i think that you know with more and more people trying it, using it, hey, they're starting to, you know, infuse, you know, foods and things with, with cannabis now. So you can have a cannabis dinner. Uh, and, and I think that it will become very similar to like wine. There'll be like certain areas where it's grown that you want to, you know, get your cannabis from. And uh, there's just so many uh, opportunities to use it in many different ways that we haven't even begun to explore. Right. Well, all right. So what do you see as ancillary uh, businesses starting up around, like uh, going into some of these other areas? Well, you know, there's just so many businesses that, that work with the cannabis industry. You know, there's like one company that, that produces drones that fly over a crop and they can monitor, you know, the moisture content and sunlight and everything and knows, okay, this quadrant needs more sun and this quadrant needs more water and you know there's lighting companies there's fertilizer companies scott's um uh liquid green you know the the scott's um uh, miracle grow that's what i'm thinking about uh is invested heavily into the the, the cannabis industry and, and and using their you know know-how to help with fertilizers and things to, to to grow a better product uh more efficiently and so there's just, you know, um, our industry, you know, accounting. I mean, there's just so many that are that are all like now working in this industry, helping uh, them, you know, as the market matures. Do, do you see uh, a change in the federal policy toward cannabis in the near future? You know, I, I have to say, and this is a personal note, you know, Chuck Schumer's, um, you know, plan to legalize cannabis you know it's all great you know in a utopian society but i think it's trying to 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 get too many you know things accomplished in one single bill mm -hmm. and i think that even the democratic party is having their own you know conflicts about how far they want to go with legalization and i would have much preferred you know we get safe banking 
uh, passed so that cannabis companies can have full access to banking services, which then gives a paper trail that allows accounting firms like us to be able to trace the money, uh, allows them to pay their taxes, you know, with a check or, you know, through wire transfer, and they don't have to run to a, um, a local office with a bag full of cash. I mean, they're going to dig it up out of the ground in that big burlap bag, right? Yeah, well, and digging it in the ground is not such a great idea. We had one client that, that dug a hole in the ground, literally buried their money because they figured, hey, I'm right on top of it. It's safe. Well, they went to, you know, get their money. And then, you know, in a period of months, the money started to, to disintegrate because it's really, you know, oh, cash oh, is really made out of cloth. <laughs> And so you just buried cloth into the oh, ground man. and it disintegrated. We have oh. other clients that had pallets, like pallets of, of, of cash stored in a warehouse and rats got into the cash oh, and started, you know, eating away at the serial numbers. And if both serial numbers on a, on a particular bill are gone, you can't take it to a bank or the Federal Reserve and exchange it for a new one. That money is literally gone. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we do need to. We need to, to, to make get the banks involved with this. Uh, yeah, you know, getting that and, and two eighty e is a tax code section that limits the ability for cannabis companies to deduct all of their expenses, and that would be a huge change too that would benefit the industry because they're working on very small margins once you factor in all these taxes, and that's what people don't realize. They think that oh, they're they're growing the crop for X dollars. They're selling it for, you know, multiples of that. And therefore, there's huge profits to be made. But once you factor in all the taxes, I mean, the taxes can be 40 to 45 percent of your gross income. That's mm -hmm. huge. So that, that doesn't leave a whole lot. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you're gross. <laughs> yeah, gross. exactly. Not your net income. And that's why many companies that are starting in this business are undercapitalized and they don't realize that, hey, if you got a million dollars to start up a cannabis company, that's probably not enough. You probably need a closer to two to three million dollars to start mm -hmm. a cannabis company because of all these unexpected taxes and costs. Right, right. Well, all right. So are you looking for new clients right now? Sure. We're always, you know, looking um, for new clients. And, and what is surprising about this industry is I've seen new clients that start with a hundred thousand a month in sales next quarter they're doing ten thousand a month in sales and maybe by the end of the year they're doing a million a month in sales so the growth in this industry is astronomical if you've got a good supply chain a great product and then it gets picked up by consumers and really appreciated um, you can go very quickly you know in this industry unlike other industries where you know it takes you know, years and years uh, to develop a uh, a product or something that that achieves these level of sales, even on small margins. Exactly. Yes, and that's why you got to have a good funding source. You know, so that you can continue what you started. You know, and that's what happens is oftentimes, you know, they get going, but then they you know have a bad crop or something you know unexpected happens and they don't have any reserves to to be able to continue on and many of the licenses in california for instance are being sold now because during covid although it was great for the cannabis industry in terms of being able to stay open and make sales if you didn't have a a, a supply chain to be able to sell the product to 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 consumers well then you, you couldn't make any profit because you had nothing to sell. Right. Well, now, do you help people find financing? We don't help people find financing, but what we do do is we can help them with their finances so that a lender, an investor, um, you know, will be able to come in and, and make a, a prudent investment by seeing that, look, their books and records are, are correct. They have internal controls and policies and procedures in place. Uh, we know that, you know, since this is a very cash-oriented business, that you got to have a close, you know, policies and procedures surrounding cash so that you don't have, you know, 5 to 10 percent of your revenue going out the back door because uh -huh. you know your employees or whoever are stealing from you. So right. those are the kinds of things that 
investors are looking at to make sure that, hey, does management have their their books, you know, in order? And is it something that can be audited and verified? So so somebody who wanted to uh, wanted to expand, wanted to find investors or wanted to start up might find it very helpful to talk with you. Yes, yes. I mean, and, and that's the thing is, is you want to get off started on the right foot. You know, and, and that's where many companies, you know, sometimes, you know, don't think about accounting and don't think about some of these these things as, as anything that is more of a nuisance. You know, it doesn't generate any revenue for me. Um, but it's these things that become very important down the road. And, and certainly if you're going to do an audit, you know, if you were to say, hey, let's do an audit of our 2021, you know, numbers now. Well, we would have to go back to January 1 and determine what your beginning inventory is. Well, that's a very difficult thing to do now that we're here at the end of August to try to figure out what really happened between January and August of this year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it, now, uh, and especially what you're doing, uh, sounds to me like like the cannabis industry requires somebody who has a knowledge about the unique opportunities and also obstacles in this industry. It's not just a CPA who could say, here's how you do it. Yeah, I mean, there's so many parts to it. You know, it starts really at the beginning, working with the attorneys, uh, figuring out what's the corporate best corporate entity for you to have. You know, do you want to be a C-Corp? Do you want to be a partnership? And that all depends on what are the investors' interests. You know, if you're a partnership, you have what is called a flow through and, and, you know, the losses or profits flow through to the investors. Um, in the early years, those investors may want losses because most cannabis companies are going to operate at a loss in the beginning years. And then maybe later on and down the road, they may want to be a C Corp so they can be acquired by another C Corp and they can exchange you know, stock for stock of the other company and maybe a, a tax free exchange. So there's just many, you know, considerations to think about, you know, the, the corporate structure, you know, taxes, everyone, you know, has their own way of doing 280E, you know, but you have to be able to support, you know, how you're, you're, you're taking these different positions on 280E. And tell and me then, about 280E, what is 280E? So 280E is a, uh, a tax code section that limits cannabis companies from taking only their cost of goods sold deduction, which is, you know, all those costs used to produce a product is deductible, but marketing costs and general accounting, you know, costs are not deductible. And that's a huge factor because that can be anywhere from, you know, 15 to 25% of your, your expenses that you just don't get to take. So that, of course, increases your, your taxable income and now you pay more tax. What, what was the thinking behind that, do you think, when that, is that just for cannabis companies? No, it's all Schedule One drugs. So what happened was there was a case that, uh, you know, occurred you know, a while back, you know, I want to say in the 70s, 80s, where um, someone, you know, was paying their, 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 their taxes, but they were taking all their deductions. Uh, because as we know in Al Capone, the way he got uh, busted was because he failed to pay taxes on all his illegal um, booze uh, operations. So this guy did pay his taxes, but he was taking all his deductions. And the IRS said, uh-uh, we, we're not going to allow you to take all these deductions. Uh, we're not going to make this an, an easy uh, endeavor for people to get into this business. So those drugs that are what we call schedule one includes not only cannabis but it includes cocaine and morphine and all of the bad you know drugs that are out there and and that's one of the things that that everybody is is trying to change as well at the federal level is to deschedule uh cannabis so it's no longer a schedule one drug that can right. now take all the deductions that a normal business takes so that that would be the route to uh eliminating this hurdle Yes, it would. To, to, to what is it? D. D. Schedule. D. Schedule from uh, Schedule One. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, uh, all right. So, so you do a lot of looking around at the country. You you have offices in a variety of places. What do you see happening in the country right now? In, in uh, the people you're talking to, uh, and uh, 
would assume many of them are in business, not all, but what, what do you see? Well, I'm, I'm seeing that, you know, this industry is, is, is expanding rapidly, particularly to the East Coast. And, you know, Virginia has become the first true southern state below the Mason-Dixon line to allow adult use um, consumption. And, and that's going to trigger all the other southern states to, to fall in order eventually. And, and I think that, you know, again, it all comes back to the tax revenue. You know, many, you know, state and local jurisdictions see this as a, as a ripe opportunity to generate taxes that's voluntary. You know, if you don't consume cannabis, you won't be paying this tax. If you do consume, you will. And, and, and it allows these governments to limit whatever increases they may want to have in sales taxes and other types of taxes and let cannabis be the entity that shores up their, their revenue base. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, uh, during the opioid crisis, we certainly know that there were lots of people from West Virginia and that particular part of the world who would drive all the way down to Florida and bring back massive amounts to sell. So it's interesting if when Virginia becomes a state that's uh, has legitimate cannabis sales it it's people just going to go across the uh, the line to to, yeah. to buy and, and and the state patrol is not going to be able to stop every car and, and have like a checkpoint you know to like see you know and, and we're talking about you know you know small quantities enough that you could fit in your trunk that yes. it would be enough you know right, right. so I think that, you know, that's the other thing is, is that I think that, you know, cannabis is going to be something that, that is, is going to be a, across the nation eventually, but it's probably going to go on a state by state basis. I don't really see federal legalization sure. happening anytime soon. Sure. And the other problem that happens with federal legalization that people don't realize is that each state set up these rules to protect their own, right. you know, right. industry. They don't want California cannabis being shipped to New York because, you know, in New York, they're going to have to grow a lot of it indoors and that's yeah. more costly. And they yeah. want to protect those people that have made those investments yeah. uh, to get those licenses and, and so you don't really want interstate commerce of, of cannabis. So outside of cannabis and hemp, uh, what do you see in terms of the business climate? Outside in, in what, what manner? Well, I mean, what you are in contact with lots of people. I'm sure you guys talk at Armanino about what you see. What do you see in terms of the business climate in the next five years? Well, it, it's it's certainly a tremendous amount of growth that we've had. I mean, our practice has grown, you know, over two hundred and fifty percent year over year, uh, and six hundred and fifty percent the year before that. So, you know, it, it is growing tremendously, and and we don't see it stopping anytime soon. You know, as these new states come on, um, there will be just more and more opportunities. You know, for cannabis companies to expand their brand into these new jurisdictions. Uh huh. Good. Well, what would what would you suggest to people? Uh, I guess uh, there would be people who are currently involved in growing or selling, distributing cannabis, and another group would be those who were considering that. What What would you recommend that they do? Well, I think the ones that are already established certainly should, you know, get their books and records in order um, because one of the things that we're seeing is, is like these local taxes can be very tedious to deal with. And even the local jurisdictions don't even know how to administer some of their, their taxes because the tax form says one thing and the regs say something else. And so you want to stay on top of that because that's how you can lose your license. If you fail to pay your taxes, especially at the <laughs> local level, yeah. that's when they'll shut you down. And you yeah. don't want that to happen and, and, you know, you know, mess up all the hard earned, you know, dollars that you've made over the years. And new industry, new companies that want to, you know, get established, I say, you know, like, you know, make sure that you're, you're well capitalized because it's going to cost you more than you think. Uh, there's going to be certainly delays in getting your license. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, social equity programs are out there so that it, it does give an opportunity for anyone that really wants to get into this industry to, to do it. But the key for them is going to be to have an adequate funding source. So you right. need to have family, friends, investors, whoever, uh, that are going to be able to, you know, pay those bills in the, the early days uh, so that you can get this, this operation going. Well, if they wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Sure, I'm uh, at Armanino, and they can contact me uh, via email. Is probably the best way to get a hold of me, which is Mike dot Goral G O R A L at Armanino A R M A N I N O L L P dot com. That's wonderful. It's a, it's been great talking with you, Mike, because this is a, certainly a fast growing uh, part of the industry, and it's going to have a a larger and larger impact on on how we do business, not only in California but all across the country. It certainly is, and thank you again, Will, for having me on your show. Absolutely. been listening to the pilgrim on the 405 with will christ to hear more of the programs in this podcast go to www.willchrist.com